seismic velocity is an intrinsic property of a subsurface material. However, we use velocity concept here in the data processing. So now we discuss about velocities in the processing concept. That's different. So from this point, we shall see your velocities you derive the form the processing are not straightforward equal to the, the seismic velocity of rocks. It's concept the same, but uh, for the seismic velocity, it's an intrinsic property of uh, rocks, but the processing, you have a difference. So that you should know, as I, I said again, the limitation of the seismic uh, processing. But maybe in a very high sort of similarity to the true velocities. In the processing, we have a number of velocities. One is called uh, interval velocities, right? Instead of uh, the intrinsic velocity for specified type of rocks, but we're talking about uh, a layer. As the layer maybe is number of sediment formation combined. Uh, so, so that's a layer artificially uh, separate. So the interval velocity means the velocity average within this interval, which means within this interface to another interface, right? That's called the interval velocity. Effectively, it is an like average velocity within the given layer. That's close to the, uh, closely uh, related to the geology, right? We can say uh, carbon reservoirs, carbon layer have a such a such high velocity if we compare the velocity in the classic locks, right? So you can say that this is the geological concept. Another one important velocity a concept called the migration velocities. The migration velocity, uh, the, from the terminology here, you can see that this is uh, uh, the velocity for you generate the best optimum migration section. Somehow the velocity for migration is in between so-called interval velocity here and the stacking velocity. As I said, we try to generate two types of uh, seismic profi profiles. One stacking, a uh, stacked profile, right? One's a migrating profile. So that's velocity is between these two. So smaller than interval velocity, higher than stacking velocity. That's the usual case. When we talk about stacking velocity, which means the velocity for generate the optimal stack section. We're talking about stacking velocity. Sometimes we also call it NMO velocity. NMO and the stacking velocities are, are almost equivalent, but not exactly. We will see this, the subtle difference. Another concept called IMS velocity, uh, the, this one is easily to be confused with uh, NMO or stacking velocity. They are not exactly the same. IMS is root mean square. So this is a mathematical terminology. NMO's velocity and the stacking velocity is from seismic data processing. So those two are not the same. But in the sum uh, specified uh, acquisition geometry, they are very close. CMP concept, we, show, we showed this diagram before. You have source receiver, source receiver. So from this source, this receiver, the distance to H, H means half of the source receiver offset. H is half offset. And the midpoint here, those six pairs of source receivers came from the same reflection point if subsurface structure is flat. The traces from these six receivers are put it together as a CMP gather. So for the traces from the CMP gathers, if you see the travel time, T here is travel time, you can easily derive based on the triangle here, from a source point to the midpoint, and from a midpoint to the reflector point, from this 
triangle, you can easily find the, the distance from this dot to the CR, CERP point, right? The straight line. That is, so you end up this formula. T square means, means your travel time from here, from source down to the CRP, go to the, go back to the surface. The total travel time here equal to T at time, at offset zero, T naught squared plus from here to here, the, the travel distance divided by velocity, this the time from here to here squared. Squared of this, squared of this equals square root, right? This is a hyperbolic equation. This diagram gives you at least two things you should uh, know that. One, doesn't matter how many layers in between, you just assume from here, surface down to this target reflection, there's a constant velocity. So velocity is average from the surface down to the target reflection. Secondly, this concept came from assumption uh, reflection is horizontally layered. So velocity in, in the common midpoint together or velocity in this uh, hyperbolic equation is a constant velocity, it's average velocity. It's not really the, the rock velocity, right? That's the average velocity. Different to F here, the travel time will be different. T naught for this depth, T naught is constant. So in this uh, equation, when velocity is constant, I said it's average, right? So the variable here is H or 2H. For larger offset, your velocity generally larger. Yeah, so travel time behavior as a function for offset. Again, assumes constant velocity, okay? And uh, if with the constant velocity, let's say exactly a hyperbolic function, hyperbolic equation, the curve is exactly hyperbolic curve. That's if we lost the constant, right? And the controlled, actually, that's controlled by the interval velocities. So the average depends on the actual layered velocity within within this interval. So that if we have a 10 layers here, each layer velocity will affect the final average, right? Okay. That's the called a move out in a CMP gather. As we said, if subsurface is constant velocity, we have a perfect hyperbolic curve. So now we just uh, try to explore this uh, hyperbolic uh, feature for our stacking analysis, stacking processing. That's the logic here. If we know the layer velocity within that layer is constant, we can use that out we call the normal out to correct your CMP gators and to generate what you want, right? To explore that. So explore how body chop time behavior. You see that because it's theoretically for constant velocity have how we curve. So now we in reality, our CMP gator is nearly hyperbolic curve. We can explore hyperbolic curve as a very good approximation to do the processing. The purpose of uh, an MO correction is to try to convert any non-zero offset traces to the zero offset traces, as we said. Uh, that means you, 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 you change the times at any non-zero offset trace to the T naught, to the time T naught at the zero offset. So for NMO correction, we do need one parameter here, which is velocity. This diagram is actually the concept. Right, that's vertical access is time from 
in second times zero point five one one point five right and horizontally is uh, x here actually is x equal to two h x is a uh, source receive distance and uh, it's a uh, equal to 2h. H is a half of this offset. Because of, uh, h equal to, uh, x equal to h, so your travel time is gradually increased around the offset. So you have a curve look like this. At this point, x here, the travel time is a tx. What you try to do, we try to move this upwards to here, to make the final final get a look like this at the same T naught. That's your purposes. So the the shift, the time shift shift from here to here is called delta T NMO. So this amount of time shift is called NMO uh, time shift, right? That's the concept. Let's see, that's, we explore the concept of a hyperbolic curve, hyperbolic curve, and then we know that hyperbolic curve is for, from a constant velocity, but now if for the subsurface, uh, it's not as a constant layer, or not single layer, but it's multiple layers. So how do we convert this multiple layer velocities into a single constant velocity, right? The easy way is to a tail expansion tail expansion. So you can use the uh, interval velocity, interval velocity, and then uh, calculate the travel time within each layer. You come out the sum of this delta T together becomes the T here. Right? That's the that's that section is the accurate solution. But you use tail expansion, you end up T square, you got the T naught square plus second order, fourth order, sixth order of offset, right? They each have a different coefficients. Okay. If we truncate at here, truncate at here, so that means you can see you have T naught, a T square that you got the T naught square plus something X squared, you see that? So if we do the second order truncation, this tail expansion formula becomes becomes this formula. Can you see that? This is how body curve. T not T square equal T not square. Here two H is X square. C1 is 1 over V squared, right? You can see here. Right? So basically, we assume we can truncate this telex expansion at second order. And then this one, we can use this to do the uh, NMO correction. Right. This truncation here give you indication you have a number of assumptions here. A, you assume source receiver are, source receiver are very close, so the offset is small. Only as offset is small, the high order terms becomes smaller, uh, ignorable, right? That's one thing. Secondly, again, all these layers must be horizontal layered. So there's two assumptions are involved. Now we compare this one to the previous one. We can see C1 is equal to one over V square RMS. RMS means root mean square of interval velocities. So many interval velocities, right? So RMS here is a mathematical derivation, but it's very close to what we want. We want a stacking velocity here, right? So this close to that, but um, it's not from the same road, just from mathematical derivation. RMS means V squared multiplied by the interval 
the weighting here and the sum of them together, divide by the order weighting, which means sum of all the data t together, which is t naught, and squ square root means you also have a square root here. Of course, we do not put square root here, we put square in the front, uh, in the left hand side. That's MS. For layer structure, let me show you here. If we have a source receiver here, the midpoint is in the middle. Next layer is source here, receiver here. Not necessarily on one side. It can be two both sides because uh, you assume the subsurface uh, absolutely horizontal layer, right? And then uh, your curve looks like this. And uh, this curvature can be represented by this approximation here. You can see that this is a second order truncation. If we want to improve this uh, uh, result, we should have uh, more high orders, four order, six order, so on, so forth, so right? So normal move out, correction, and I'm correction here for layered media. Let me repeat this approximation. Right, you chunk, you have a tail expansion, but the chunk at the second order. You assume the second order chunk uh, tail expansion is absolutely uh, approximately a hyperbolic curve. Okay. I, I already said that this is for small offset. For larger offset, we'll see different. More accurate if we have higher high orders. Include high orders, fourth order, six orders, right? The purpose of that is to try to convert your N offset to the time zero, uh, to the offset zero, to the time at the offset zero. And uh, based on mathematical derivation, based on tail expansion, that's controlled by RMS velocity, right? But uh, nowadays we can use some sort of optim optimization to get the best velocity, which is different from RMS, but to have a best optimal stack section, right? After that, up, when, when we had a, a RMS formula here, we can uh, derive an inward function an inverse function of this equation just come out interval velocity. If we have a two targeted layer, for one layer you have an average velocity or RMS velocity Vn. For the slightly shallow one, you call n minus one. So the difference between the two divided by the time difference with the weight, okay? This come out the velocity. So this is called a this equation. This gentleman published the paper in geophysics. So it's called this equation, right? So based on just why we do need the velocity analysis from the such data. Use an AMO formula based on the curvature of uh, reflection in your CMB data, you can derive Vn minus one and then Vn. Use these two parameters, Vn minus one, Vn, we can derive the interval velocity between the time t n minus one and the t n, right? So you can see seismic analysis give you the velocity of subsurface. Logical here, right? So this one is very useful for building so-called depth conversion. Depth conversion. So you you convert your seismic data profile, which is in time to the depths, and this depths were related to the geological depths, okay? And this velocity also gives you a guidance for the next step for migration analysis. We'll talk about detail later. Uh, we should uh, remember this NM velocity is not, as a, not the same as uh, RMS velocity, right? RMS velocity is from Numer uh, from a mathematical calculation, mathematical derivation, from an idea, well, let's put it that way, it's from a, the model space, which is a layer model, 
you derive RMA cirrhosis, right? But for NMA cirrhosis, not. We start from a dead space, which we have such data. In short together, in the format of short together, right? Is from data derive a velocity. So they, they are not totally different anymore, right? Once from a model space, you mathematically derive RMS velocity. For NMO velocity, you, you, you start from a data space, from such data, you derive a velocity. So they are not the same, physically not the same. Numerically, they are, for if a receiver, source receiver is a small, they very close, all right? So it's approximation. So it is, uh, what NMA velocity really means, because it starts from data, your purpose is to try to make the, the data flat. This here, you try to make this flat. So this curve, you because make it flat. So the NMA velocity is, the best velocity to make this flat. Right, we already said IMS velocity is for only for small set. So we'll see in the later stage, you will, uh, if we increased of, uh, the order of a uh, uh, tail expansion, you'll have a more accurate uh, more accurate uh, or flattened uh, reflections. Again, let's repeat. RMS velocity is from uh, the physical space from the model based on the layered velocity. I, I give you all the layered velocity here. Seven, uh, that's 1500, uh, 200, uh, 2500, 3500. You know, just based on this velocity, you mathematically derive RMS velocity, okay? And uh, because you know exactly velocity, exactly depth, exact time, you can have an idea of flat situation. But that's from model space to generate velocity, to derive it. For high order, as I said, telex before, we assume the refraction is uh, in hyperbolic curve. That's it's the second order tail expansion. But tail expansion have a more high order terms. If we improve the high order terms, we'll increase that, uh, increase accuracy. That's for shorter, uh, for the small set. But in the reality, acquisition, nowadays, as we said, for single shot, we have maybe thousand receivers. So the receivers becomes a gradually, uh, the uh, offset becomes gradually larger, larger, larger. But for the larger one, definitely the second order is not good enough. So you do need high order terms, right? Okay. For high order terms, there are a uh, number of uh, uh, formulas or number of approaches, uh, approaches to, to do that. Just show you one uh, demonstration here. See the high order term uh, has a significant uh, improvement to, the, to your final result. This uh, CMP together. From here, left to right, the offset gradually increased because you, you can see the curve in that way. And uh, this vertical axis is times. And uh, this curve looks like hyperbolic, hyperbolic curve, right? So if we use a second order angle, which is a hyperbolic curve, you can see for the near offset, they are flat. But for not that far, just in the, in, uh, Intermediate offset, they already you can see curve not flat. See that? You want to get this flat, you need a, in this case called six order, right? I put one thing here called optimal six order. Really means this is not derived based on the interval velocity calculated from second order or fourth order. This means we assume we have a C1. For x for the second order, c2 for fourth order, c3 for the sixth order, and then we just like inversion, we try to best fit your data 
uh, to the deter to, to, to derive your C1, C2, C3, derive your coefficient for different terms in your tail expansion. That's called the optimization. You can see in in the geophysics, uh, typically in the in the processing stages, every step, almost every step, you can explore the inversion theory, right? Instead of from a forward procedure, from a, what do you know, and then you derive something. That's the straight forward de de uh, derivation. But uh, you can also uh, come from a inverse way, right? You set up formula and then you optimize each, each individual parameters to get the final result. So it's just optimized, right? Optimized. So that means even use a six order, you may not have such a you know excellent flattened layer, flattened reflection, right? If they're flattened, the reflection uh, comes to flat, if you stack them, you they have no time shift, right? You enhance the signal. That's that's straightforward. One factor is called a, a stretching factor. An angle correction is done by point by point. So for this time, we don't know exactly offset, right? For this time, because the offset, if we do a calculation, this one should move to here. For the next point, it should be here. For the next point it should be here, right? So. The striking factor means a ratio between the ratio of after an MO, point A, point B, point 1, point 2 here, the time interval, to the original time interval, to the, to the time interval in the original trace. So this is called the stretching factor. Right? Very likely for the typical fish for zero reflections, the stretch vector greater than one, right? Greater than one. So you do need, in the process, you are, do need to know the stretch factor. For the postgraduate students, you can see if we can invent something, we also do an MO, but you do not have such a stretch factor. That'd be absolutely advanced technology. Right? That's the research direction. Now let's see it that way. So in the processing, straightforward, a simple, simplest uh, brutal way is you just mute out this uh, this part has uh, which has a higher stretching factor. So this red curve, a uh, red red line here, is a constant stretching. So you just set up like a 1.2 or 1.5, depends yourself, right? You can see you just mute out. So this this is the distorted waveforms will be uh, excluded from your stack section from your stack trace. So after muting, the rest part you you just simply sum them together. You can see you you make, you get rid of this, right? Well, in the stack it's fine, but for the reservoir prediction, that's the Terrible loss, uh, terrible loss of uh, information, right? Because for reservoir prediction, you do need to know the amplitude variations with the offset. That's the key information for you to know the subsurface uh, local physics, the reservoir properties, right? So if we mute out this, for example, you don't know what the offset information here. I mean, A, V, U information, amplitude variation with an offset, right? So that's for the simple stack, that's fine, you mute, but you you better do not for the later stage for the reservoir uh, characterization. So I just share you, share with you the, the assumption here, so you know what's the limitation of your process data. That's a real data example for different CMP, right? That's the same. And uh, the, the near offset on the right hand side and the flat the layer here, right? You can see in the slightly high, 
uh, the far offset, you have a distorted uh, waveform because of uh, because of the stretching factor, right? So you need a mute out this. So next slide, you can see the mute out, right? Okay. But in the shallow part, you cannot completely mute out because you need to keep something. So usually, just use this sort of a muting, and they, they stack. That's quite uh, straightforward, but it's not really the best way to do that. Let's uh, repeat what I said. NM caching, we try to, based on the property of this curve, we assume this a hyperbolic curve. If it is a constant velocity, that's hyperbolic curve. And then we based on this, we can generate, uh, we can uh, convert each at the time at each offset to the time of uh, zero offset. Okay. This is source receiver pair, source receiver pair. Okay, now, as I said, uh, NMO depends on velocity. So now, if velocity is wrong, what happens? Right? So this is the effects of velocity errors in NMO. That's also give us the indication for how to do velocity analysis. Ideally, we try to get a flat perfection. But if velocity is too low, you end up overcorrected. If velocity is too high, it's called undercorrected. Why is that? Let's go back and see this formula here. The co That's the t square equal to t naught square plus x square. In the front, it's a c1. c1 is 1 over v square, right? The v here is, is in the Position of a, uh, as a dominator here, a denominator, right? So if V bigger, that, that TNMO basically is a T square minus T naught square square root, right? So if V is large, this C becomes smaller. So if c, c is if v is large, c is square, uh, smaller. So delta t is uh, smaller than you sh it should be. So this uh, undercorrected. If velocity is too high, it's uh, one over a higher a number means your delta t is bigger. So that means you overcorrected. Right? It was the curve was here, but then you because your delta t is too big, so overcorrect. That's the way it give us uh, either manually or use computer automatically to do the velocity analysis. So you try to maximize maximally to flat the refraction. That's the way to do the velocity analysis. So as a, so we see that the phenomena of a uh, uh, velocity errors in NMO. So this phenomena can be explored to as an indicate, indicator for velocity analysis. Right. So next step, we're talking about velocity analysis. Just be, simply based on the previous slides. There's tools. There are tools for the velocity analysis. Uh, long before the modern day is compute, compute, uh, computer everywhere, computer for everything. We use a paper, pen and a paper. The methodology for velocity and that's called T square X square method. Uh, you will understand that. And now uh, we also talking about NMO correct getters. We also have a so-called constant velocity stack. That's another tool. We have a uh, Stack amplitude and the, or stack power, semblance and the velocity. So this, those are the the current. Well, not the current. I mean, for conventional uh, tool to more than those tools, right? So the difference nowadays is, uh, well, this tools still same as uh, before, but no more. Li most likely, computer can do that automatically, right? Uh, even use AI. 
to the NISS, artificial intelligence way to do that, but uh, fundamental concepts are still here. But let's talk about first one, t square x square. Uh, in fact, in the previous uh, year's examination, I, I did ask students do, to do this exercise in the exam in the examination paper. So I just see to try to understand try to understand this concept, which is hyperbolic equation. Try to understand, okay. This hyperbolic equation we see a few times. If you think about t squared as a single function, I just simply put f here. t naught is a, a, is a tx at t x equal to zero, right? So, and the x squared, I just see x squared as a single parameter. So you can see that's Hyperbolic curve, everything is squared, but we can think about it as a linear equation. You see that? The variables is u, u is a t x squared, and the t squared is a f. So that's, you can easily consider this uh, second order equation, hyperbolic equation, as a 1d uh, linear equation. OK, so this is the way to do that. So if we have this 1D uh, equation, linear equation, this uh, is a variable, this will be the slope of the line, right? And that this is a, what's called an interceptor at, x equal, at u equal to 0, right? This interceptor. So for any half work, curve, you can come up to u. Uh, you know the u, you can come up to the coefficient here, slope. E example here. In this CMP gathers, in this CMP gather, you have uh, uh, four reflections, right? And uh, in the middle, we have this called a velocity spectrum analysis. So what do they do? They use a constant velocity assume the velocity constant and the numerically uh, calculate the travel time and sum them together, you end up the power here, amplitude power, right? And then you can horizontally find out the maximum power point is here. At, right? At this point, you have a maximum amplitude, uh, a maximum, uh, yeah, amplitude or maximum power. So this one corresponds to 20, 2000. So that means you say at this time, basically here, this layer, the velocity from top to here is 2000. Okay. And another one, you have a curve with this one because it's a similar thing. So this is called a, a, a peak log, just to find out the peak. So this is the, the amplitude power spectrum. Amplitude of power. Now, we change x square as a single parameter we consider x square as a single parameter as a as a first order parameter like a, as a presented u and uh, t square as a function f but right, just t square so we have a t not square which is a f not square f not square f f, f not t not square f is f not there's a curve here that's the intersection to here. Huh? The intersection here is t, uh, is uh, t naught square. And uh, the slope here is one over velocity square. You can see. So you find out this point. You find out the final point. You you can have this point. Finally, you become this point. This point you do a straight line, and then you. From straight line, you can see how many x squared. Here, how many t squared? t squared divided by x squared is a slope, right? That's a for need as in. So t squared divided by x squared is a slope. One of slope is the velocity square. So you can find it, right? So this is the way t squared x squared analysis. The 
So what another method called a constant velocity analysis. If we, for the same gather, we use different velocity to do the anemone correction, and then we see what the result looks like. For this one, we use a 1480. You can see the, the red one here is flat. So that means the water bottom get flat. So that means you can know here that's the water layer. However, because velocity is too low, velocity is too low, you, you cannot get a, the subsurface refraction here, subsurface is a overcorrected, right? Overcorrected. But here you do see something also flat. You can see here, also flat. Why is that? Because this layer, this layer, this refraction, this refraction have a same velocity as, as this one. What is this refractions? What are the refractions? These are the water layer refractions, which is which are the multiples. Yeah, you your way bouncing within the water layer. Velocity is constant within water layer. Okay. Now, if we increase the velocity by uh, to the fifteen sixty, this layer is not flat because the velocity is higher higher than the true velocity. You remember, if velocity two is higher, your angle is uh, undercorrected. You can see this one undercorrected. It's not flat, right? So you can, based on this, you can make you already make sure yourself this one and this one are uh, water bottom refraction, water bottom, uh, water layer related multiple, water layer related multiple. Right? And then you got a 2000, you have uh, something here flat, but it's just a water layer multiple, water layer refraction of water layer multiple, multiples are uh, undercorrected. That's the phenomenon. But for constant velocity panel, you, you have a uh, different so many panels and find out if uh, any corresponding uh, refractions, you know, uh, the velocity for any uh, refractions. Another tool called a stacking power, stack power or stack uh, amplitude. Power amplitude, what's the relationship between these two? Basically, amplitude square is a power. Okay. Now, if we give you your velocity, that's the different velocities, and uh, what call it that here for the tall. Tall really means uh, the time at zero offset, because in the field maybe you do not have zero of stress, because your source and the receiver always have distance, right? Even the smallest offset is not zero. So tall really means projected to zero offset, okay? So you bet you use a so many different velocities, use a two, two kilometers per second, you do the calculation. You get a curve and the sum of all the energy follow that curve, you end up here. And the, another velocity, 2.5 kilometers per second, you sum of the curve here and then here, you have a strongest amplitude here because this curve almost fit to this, right? But, and then uh, increase further, you have a curve fit to this and another foot to this. That's called a uh, stack power or stack amplitude, right? Stack means you follow a calculated curve. You stack all the energy, all the amplitude into one. That was stacking. Stacking have a trouble because you you could have positive negative amplitude right along the curve. You will see typically for a far offset, you have a priority changes. So somehow positive negative cancel each other, right? That could be a wrong indication. So what do they do? They want to use something called a cross correlation. But uh, that's cross correlation or semblance. That's all similar in terms of power spectrum, but the calculation. Uh, in the different way. So the cross correlation measures similarity. And uh, if we recall that in the previous uh, lessons, 
we're talking about the cross correlation use uh, fully transform, right? So cross correlation is very, very time efficient because uh, fully transform can be implemented as a fast fully transform. So just the in terms of efficiency, it's very efficient. You just transfer your seismic trace into the frequency domain and then do that multiplication and then come back. Right? But it, for the for the for the power, you don't need to come back either, because you have uh, energy conservation. The power in the time domain is the same as power in the frequency domain. So you can do the calculation in the time domain, right? But the mathematical formula, you what you do, you do the zero lag correlation. Zero lag correlation. For the ice stress and the neighboring stress, you just uh, sum up within a window. A time window into the correlation, okay? Just for zero lag. But this is called cross correlation. Correlation depends on the depends on the magnitude of your such which data, right? So to try to unify that, every different traces or every segment can be comparable. What do you do? Use a instead of cross correlation, you use a cross correlation, use a correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient is defined by the cost correlation divided by the total energy. It's normalization, basically. So normalize the cost correlation. It's called a correlation coefficient, okay? And uh, for the uh, seismic velocity analysis, we only use a zero leg. We do not use the others, right? We just use zero leg. So C here is cross correlation. Phi here is normalized cross correlation called correlation coefficient. That's for two traces. Because we have uh, so many traces, we can exploit the lateral coherency. So we can use a called a multi-channel uh, multi-channel correlation, right? Use a more not only two traces, we can use a more no, more uh, traces from neighboring hold. That's the standard cross correlation, but you sum up more traces from left to right. Okay, and the semblance is defined by zero leg, zero leg uh, term, right? So if you, that's multiple traces, but uh, if we ignore the lateral difference, you basically use a central trace energy. But uh, multiple traces, some of them together, that's called a semblance. So this is the concept where you uh, involve uh, involved to here, right? The simplified form this formula. So instead of using i and i plus k, you just use a central one. You end up central one. So you add some energy together. Right? That's a, this is a simplified version semblance. It's a simplified version of multi-channel cross-correlation. Right. Let me just repeat that. You start from zero leg cross-correlation. Zero leg means you have j, uh, j point to j point, right? It's not j minus one plus one minus two plus two. It's so zero leg, leg zero. That's the we start from cross correlation and the normal that we come up called cross correlation co uh, co correlation coefficient. If we introduce multi channels, you you sum the neighboring. So this trace not only correlated with the immediate next trace, but also correlated to other traces, k greater than one, other traces, right? So that's the accurate formula. And then you simplify this formula, just uh, assume, just so uh, you just assume they are naturally they are very similar. You just uh, use a central trace. So that's the si simplification of this. That's called a semblance. Next math tool I introduce here is called a velocity spectra. Basically, what is velocity spectra? It, it's a plotting of the previous uh, slice defined semblance. So you just uh, 
plot the semblance as a spectrum. Okay? And uh, this semblance well, is, is a plot as a function of velocity. Use different velocity, different curve equals function velocity. And uh, for vertically for all time, horizontal for velocity, vertical all time, right? That's the key parameter for velocity has either manually pick or automatic picking from your computer, right? Most likely for the undergrad students, the first job at least 10 years, 20 years ago when I was in that gym, most likely your first job is to, to do this. You spend a few months to pick a velocity from the velocity spectra. The spectral look like this, vertical axis is time, how the center axis is the velocity. Right. For different velocity, you have generated different semblance but under the energy, this contour here, right? Uh, no, that's in the colorful uh, display. This, uh, in the next term, you will have a practical uh, lecture, or you do the practical, just the data from uh, that practical. You know, you test the velocity spectrum, horizontal velocity, vertical access is the time, right? In this one, you pick up those high velocity, but low velocity, almost, just horizontal velocity, right? This velocity almost is between 1450 to 1500, or from shallow to deep, velocity almost constant. That's very likely uh, the velocity for the water layer multiples, you can see that, water layer multiple, okay? So you try to avoid that, you just pick it from here, through the, this one, get a high velocity, so just get a, a low velocity. After correction, same time you, you plot, if you pick a velocity, there's a, to the automatic correction, you can see whether it's flat or not, but here maybe it's flatted, this weak one is flatted, but there's a strong one, which is multiples, still under, under corrected, right? That gives us a very good uh, indication for one of the purposes of an error correction or under stack is try to, uh, after stack, horizontal stack, you can see this uh, outer phase, right? After stack, that's very, that's multiples can be canceled dramatically. So this is one way to improve signal ratio. The noise not only, we're talking about, it's not only the, random noise, but also coherent noise, which is multiple in this case. For the velocity analysis, we uh, emphasize this is a key step for the processing for stack, generated stack, key step for generated stack and velocity, and the next step for migration image, right? Usually, depends on the complexity of your data, you usually use a combined tools, not a, any single one. Not only single one, you can combine them. Just make sure your the velocity picking is right. So you do need to pick the velocity from the spectrum. Maybe computer can help you do some semi-automatic picking, but definitely you needs a human uh, interjection here to, to get the picking right. Uh, industry standard is you, you, you pick the velocity at every 250 meter CMPs, yeah? you pick a velocity for CMP every 250 meter, you do that. And that, of course, should be guided by geology. You know roughly the geology, but it's not a, depend on jury, okay? It's not driven by jury. Just say, you know, this uh, velocity gradually increased, but significantly at a more, uh, at a certain a certain depth, certain travel time. You know that, so it's, it's guided by geology, not driven by jury. So jury is not the constraint in your in your automatic picking, but uh, you in your mind you know that. That's a uh, a typical uh, panel 
for your velocity picking. Uh, in the practical, let's say you will see this, okay? You have a different options here. Uh, finally, of course, you can save your result, right? Different options. So here, this is the original. Uh, this here is a one shot together. You know, you do the different velocity picking. Uh, here's flat, but if your velocity higher, maybe you get this layer flat, but this uh, water layers over cracked it, right? This water layer flat, water layer multiple flat, but here higher velocity water layer over cracked it, right? And uh, here, this uh, local, so called a local stacking. So this for single CMP, you stack it generally single trace, but in the neighbor hold of number of CMPs, you stack all the traces so you see neighboring CMPs, you same velocity whether you have a flat uh, refraction here, right? Just give a point and then you can pick from here, just see where it's uh, horizontally flatted, you come up. And uh, also, uh, from this picky point, you display this, follow this curve, you display here. This seems like at the local CMP point in the middle, at a local position, it's very short uh, horizontally, a very short uh, distance uh, stack section, right? A section. And uh, this gives you guidance for the picking. You, you, you pick this point, dots here, but they give you, tell you if we increase 10%, decrease 10%, increase 15%, decrease 15%, you know, the velocity variation. Okay. So the guardians, you, you do not want to say, okay, from here and then it jump to another 200%. Now that's ridiculous and wrong, right? So they give a guardians, roughly, you should pick within this range. Okay. That's that. Get us with a different velocity. And uh, this is partial stack. That's uh, the panel stack, local stack panel, and the spectrum. And finally, you do the picking every 200 meters. You have uh, this pick point, and your velocity can be horizontal linked, generate you know, a smooth velocity model. That's the model, this velocity model can be used for the velocity, uh, for the angular question. For example, a CMP at the middle here, you basically, you see the, uh, the linear interpretation. So you, you take a velocity here, use uh, the local velocity for angular question, right? 